25, and the verses were 31 through 46. When we look at Matthew chapter 24 and 25, it's in these two chapters that Jesus is giving a message, a message which is commonly called or commonly known as his Olivet Discourse. He talks about the destruction of the temple in the beginning of this message, and it is from this point that he begins to address the signs of the times. And not only the signs of the times, but the abomination of desolation and the coming of the Son of Man. After he goes over these things, our Savior begins to give lessons and parables in order to bring application to what thus saith the Lord. He gives a lesson about a fig tree and he begins to tell two parables. The first parable, he begins to talk about the ten virgins. And after this parable, he begins to talk about the talents. But in between his discourse, he makes it abundantly clear that no one knows the day or the hour of this judgment. And now this brings us to our scriptural text of Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 through 46, in which in those verses, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ addresses the final judgment. It is in this day that every man, that every woman, that every boy and every girl, every prophet, priest, and king's soul will have to give an account for the deeds or the lack of deeds done or not done in the body. It is in this day that the Savior will actually pass down a sentence upon each individual that it qualifies in humanity. It will mean salvation to some, but it will also mean condemnation to others. And he identifies in this text the righteous as well as the unrighteous. He identifies the righteous as sheep, which will be separated to his right. And then he identifies the unrighteous as goats, and they will be separated to his left. The righteous will hear the words in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34, where Jesus says, come. You who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But the unrighteous will not hear those words. The unrighteous will hear different words. And the words that they will hear are found in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, where Jesus says, depart from me, you cursed into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The righteous, according to verse 46, will receive eternal life, but the unrighteous will receive eternal punishment. My question is, why? Why will the righteous receive eternal life? And why will the unrighteous receive eternal damnation or eternal punishment? Well, the answer to that question is this. It is because the righteous had something that the unrighteous didn't have. The unrighteous had soul security. And that's what I want to talk about on this morning. I want to talk about soul security. Soul security. Not S-O-L-E security, but S-O-U-L security. Those of us who are righteous recognize that our soul is extremely valuable. There is nothing in this world that can match the value of your soul. According to Jesus, the righteous secured their soul in him by doing some things. The righteous had compassion on others. The righteous displayed concern for others. The righteous invested in the care 
of others. In other words, an unrighteous person is selfish, but a righteous person is selfless. In understanding the words of Jesus, we know that there is great reward and satisfaction in meeting the physical needs of man. Nevertheless, we make our calling and election sure by meeting the needs of the spiritual man as well. So as souls that are tabernacling in this body, we all have spiritual needs, which only Jesus can fill. And Jesus is using the righteous to do it. I mean, a man can be well fed and well drunken physically, but still hunger and thirst spiritually. A man can even be well known in society and yet that same man can still be a stranger to the Lord. A man can be well dressed and have more clothes than he knows what to do with and yet a still appear naked before almighty God. A man can even have a clean bill of health physically but they could be dying on the inside because they are sick spiritually. A man can walk the streets as a free individual and yet be imprisoned by chains and bonds spiritually, continually to be shackled to the ways of sin. And for these reasons, Christ is calling upon us. Christ is calling upon the righteous. To keep our souls secure by doing what we can in an effort to secure the souls of others. There's five points that I would like to bring to your attention on today. I didn't say this morning. I said today because as I'm looking at my notes, I may not get to all five points this morning. And so we're going to at least try to deal with two or three points on this morning. Depends on how long. Uh, the preacher preaches this morning, but at least two to three points on this morning, and then the lesson will be yours to respond to. Our first point is found in Matthew chapter five, 25, and the verse is 35. Matthew chapter 25, verse 35, is where we're going to find our first point. Jesus says, for I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. These are the words of Jesus to the righteous. And what this helps us to understand is not only that there are people in the world who hunger and thirst physically and we have to meet those needs, but spiritually speaking, there are people who hunger and thirst spiritually and they also have needs that must be met. Listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 and the verses 6. In Matthew chapter 5, and the verse is six. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Jesus lets us know that there is a different type of hunger, that there is a different type of thirst out there. And he is calling upon the righteous to help satisfy this wanting, this lack in their lives and only Jesus can fill it and Jesus makes that clear in John chapter 6 and the verses 35 in John chapter 6 and the verse is 35 Jesus is recorded as saying that I am the bread of life whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now keep that in mind as we fast forward to the book of Revelation. Revelation, the chapter is 7, and we're going to begin reading at verse 13. In Revelation chapter 7, beginning with verse 13, the Bible reads, Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, 
Who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? I said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst anymore the sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes see there are many my brothers and sisters who hunger and thirst after righteousness so the righteous must Fill this void by introducing the spiritually hungry and the spiritually thirsty to Jesus. And Jesus identifies himself, according to John chapter 6, verse 35, as the bread of life. This means that he is the most essential part of life. Now, somebody may say, well, well bread is not that good for you. Why would Jesus identify himself as the bread of life? Well, we need to take off our 21st century lenses and we need to put on our first century lenses and look at the text in which Jesus says he is the bread of life. 2,000 years ago, people did not use forks and spoons and knives to eat their food like we do today. In other words, people 2,000 years ago ate their food like we eat our food in the South. We use bread for everything. We use biscuits not only as a side, absolutely not. We use biscuits to sop up everything that is left over from the food that we just ate. Amen, Amen that's right. <laughs> and, and, and so understand that if you left somebody some food and you did not give them bread, then that means that you have not given them the essential tools they needed to clean their plate. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. You cannot live in life without me. I am the essential part. You need me to pick up the food. You need me to be the food. And you need for me to pick up all the fragments in your life that are broken and left over. With me, you can do nothing. Jesus is the bread of life. He is the most essential part. Without him, we have no life. And in order to satisfy our hunger and thirst and quench our thirst, we must come to Jesus and not only come to Jesus, but we have to believe in him. And then what we read in Revelation chapter 7, verses 13 through 17, will be our future. The Bible goes on to tell us that if we long for righteousness, then we will come to Jesus and believe in him. And if we remain steadfast in Jesus, then we will go to a place called heaven, a place where there is no more hunger, a place where there is no more thirst. And this is our responsibility to those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, to fill that void with Jesus and to help them to remain faithful so they will go to a place where they will never hunger and thirst again. And for as long as we are doing that to help others, in turn, we are helping ourselves, keeping our souls secured in him. Now listen to what Jesus says further in Matthew chapter 25, verse 35. He says, for I was a stranger and you welcomed me. He said, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. We understand that, that, that there are individuals that we'll come across that are strangers to us and they are strangers to us because we do not know them. But we recognize that there are other individuals who are strangers to Jesus. Because they don't know Christ and Christ has no relationship with them. It's one thing to create a friendship with man. And it's another thing to look beyond the physicality of man and seek to have fellowship with that same man. And the only way we can have 
fellowship with man is if we introduce that man to Jesus and that person receives fellowship and has fellowship with Jesus, which means we can now have fellowship with that man. Let's do your Bible in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. In Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 11, listen to the words of the Apostle Paul as he describes the situation of the Ephesians before they had a relationship with Jesus. He says, therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross thereby killing the hostility and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near for through him we both have access in one spirit to the father so then you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. When we look at these verses, the Bible tells us that there are many who are strangers to the Lord. So the righteous must get the stranger from what we read in verse 12 to what we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. The stranger needs to be brought in because according to the text, the person who is a stranger to God spiritually is separated from Christ. A person who is a stranger is alienated from the saints, unfamiliar to the covenant of promise. A person who is a stranger has no hope. A person who is a stranger is without God. The stranger needs to be brought in, which means to be reconciled to God, which can only happen through and by Christ. This can only be accomplished by the peace of Christ, the blood of Christ, and the Spirit of God through Christ. When the stranger is brought in, that person ceases to be a stranger. They are no longer a stranger. He is now a citizen in the kingdom of God. He is now a child in the family of God. He is now a saint in the temple of God. And it is our responsibility to be able to look at a lost and dying world and do our part to make sure that they are strangers no more. See, oftentimes when it comes to salvation, we look at ourselves and we say, well, I'm not a stranger anymore or I'm no longer alienated, or I'm in the temple, or I'm in the body. And we think that by keeping ourselves isolated from a lost and dying world, that we're keeping our souls secure. But Jesus tells a different story. Jesus says, what's the point of what good is salt if it's still in the shaker? We have to learn to take who we are who Christ has made us by his blood 
And we have to get into the habit of sprinkling ourselves wherever we may go so that we can take people who are no good to God and make them good to God. Because for as long as a person is separated from God, they are no good to God. They are as good to God as a Chinese nickel in a Japanese bazaar. You can't use it there. We are in this world, not to make it better, but to make it better. We are to look at what Christ has done to us in transforming us and know that no matter how low a person may be, if they trust in my God, if they trust in my Savior, then they too can have a life change for the better. We were once strangers, but we're strangers no more. And if there's anybody else that is a stranger to Christ, that person, too, if get introduced to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, can be a stranger no more. What are we doing to secure our souls? Are we securing the souls of others by introducing, by introducing them to the one who can secure their soul? I want to close by looking at Matthew chapter 25, verse 36. In Matthew 25, verse 36, Jesus says, I was naked. I was naked, and you clothed me. I want us to look at a couple of verses here. First, I want us to take a look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Because there are many people that are spiritually naked. And they need some clothes. And they need to be clothed appropriately. Because we have to understand that even when someone is clothed inappropriately. They're still naked before God. There are people that walk the streets of Tucson because it's warm all year round. They think they're clothed. They think they're clothed, but they're naked. I mean, if you walk out your house and your, under, your, your, your outer garments are just as short as your undergarments, you didn't put on any clothes. You're still naked. You're clothed inappropriately. And so there are people that are spiritually naked. They may go to worship services, but they're clothed. They're still spiritually naked. They, they may have a Bible in their hand, but they're still spiritually naked. And so let me stop meddling. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Listen to the words of Jesus to the church in Laodicea. He says, for you say... I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Let's go back to Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. The Bible reads, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Now keep that in mind because it talks about putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us how to do that in Galatians chapter 3, verse 17. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 17, the Bible reads, I mean verse 27, Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, the Bible reads, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 
Think about the three verses that we have read. The church in Laodicea was spiritually naked and didn't even know it. There are many in the world, and there are even many in the church who are clothed inappropriately and need a change of clothes, need a new wardrobe, if you will. There are many in the world, as well as in the church, who are naked and are in need of attire altogether. So the righteous, that's you and I and those of us who have called upon the name of God, must get in the business of teaching people how to get dressed. We have to understand that a lot of people put on things and don't know what, how they're putting it on. They don't know what the purpose of certain things. I can't tell you how many weddings that I've gone to and someone says, oh, they gave me these extra parts to the tuxedo. And I'm just like, these are not extra parts. Man, these are your buttons and these are your cufflinks. And they're like, oh, is that why I look like a pirate? I mean, it's just, you, you know, they don't know how to get dressed. And so therefore, it is our responsibility to teach people how to get dress so that we can walk this planet looking wise and not like fools. There are people who are naked spiritually. There are people that don't know how to get dressed spiritually. That's where we come in because we once looked like fools. We once looked ridiculous thinking that we looked all right, thinking that we had it all together. And then someone had to tell us, no, 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 no. That's not how you look. That's not how you dress. This is not what it means to be in Christ. The person that we read about in Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14, is a person who is dressed inappropriately. And therefore, when we recognize that we are dressed inappropriately, we must cast off that which we have on. And what we have on is darkness. But once we have cast off darkness, we are not to remain naked. It is at this point that we must put on the armor of light and we must put on Christ. And how do we put on Christ? We put on Christ in baptism. See, the righteous must clothe the naked by imploring them to give up sin, to wash away sin in baptism, to put on Christ and to start walking in the light. So where do you stand? Where do you stand on this morning? We're about to sing a song. And that song is entitled, All Things Are Ready. All Things Are Ready. And I want you to know this morning that all things are ready. Your new clothes are ready. Your new relationship with Jesus Christ is ready. Your food is ready. Your drink is ready. All we need is for you to surrender all to Jesus Christ and come to the feast that has been prepared for you. A new life awaits you. A new future awaits you. A beautiful future awaits you in the kingdom of our God. God is ready to forgive your sins. Jesus has his arms wide open. We are ready to serve and meet your needs as servants and instruments of righteousness. The question is, will you have the humility and the courage to make things right with your God before it's eternally and everlasting too late? Remember that it is Jesus who we're going to have to stand before in the judgment. The Bible tells us that Jesus did no sin. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. So whatever he says in that day, it is fruitless to debate him because he's going to be always right. So if he says, I was thirsty and you didn't give me anything to drink, he's telling the truth. If he says, I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat? He's telling the truth. If he says, I didn't know you, you were a stranger to me, you didn't take me in, he's telling the truth. And so, where do you stand 
if he says you're naked. And he said, no, Lord, no, Lord, I got all my clothes from men's warehouse. He's telling the truth. So it would be wise and prudent on our part to know what he says and do what he says so heaven can be our home. If you are here on this morning, Jesus is telling you right now, John 6, 45. He says, it is written in the prophets, and they all shall be taught of God. You cannot leave here saying you didn't know. He says, they all shall be taught of God. Therefore, every man, therefore, that have heard and have learned of the Father, Jesus says, come to me. You can't say you haven't been invited. You're being invited right now to come to the feast, to come to the table of the Lord. He got room for us all. Doesn't matter what you've done. If you're willing to give up sin, cast it away. He stands ready to save your soul. A verse was read this morning, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. He would not have given you this information if he didn't love you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He wouldn't have sent Jesus if he didn't love you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but shall have everlasting life. Amen. Do you believe? Do you believe? The Bible says if you believe, you'll never thirst. If you believe, He'll fulfill your hunger. It's one thing to come to the table. But when you get to the table, you got to open your mouth. You got to use the bread of life. And you have to eat. And you have to digest. This is obedience. It's not enough just to show up. But to show up and do right. That's what he's calling you to do. Give up sin. It is Jesus who said, Luke 13, 3, I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. It is Jesus who said in Matthew 10, 32, whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. If you want Jesus to be your representative up there, it is time for you to confess him now and be his representative down here. And put on Christ this morning by being baptized this morning. Have your sins washed away this morning. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, whosoever, he says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. If you don't want to be condemned, then believe and be baptized so that you may be saved. And Jesus keeps his word. If he said he'll forgive you of your sins, he will forgive you of your sins, Acts 2.38. He'll make you a new creature in Christ Jesus, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. What kind of creature? A creature that is no longer spiritually dehydrated. A creature who is no longer going through a spiritual famine because you are now faring sumptuously on the word of God. A creature that is no longer a stranger to the creator of the universe. A creature that is no longer spiritually naked before a holy God. And God stands ready to add you add you to his church. He stands ready to secure your soul in that one church, the only church you could read about in your Bible. The Bible only talks about one. Just one. There's not no two or three or five or six hundred churches. There's only one. Jesus said he was going to build that church in Matthew 16, 18. He built that church. In Acts chapter 2, he purchased that church with his own blood so that we'll be strangers no more. According to Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he adds the saved to that church, Acts 2, 47. And that church is the church of Christ. Jesus did everything he said he was going to do 
So why not become a member of a going church for a coming Lord that does all that the Lord authorizes? That even includes securing your soul by not only looking out for the physical needs of those that we come in contact with, but also meeting their spiritual needs as well. So to the Christian, this word is for you. Yeah, you've already obeyed the gospel. Yeah, you're already in the church. Yeah, you're here every Sunday. That's great and that's good. But the question is, how many people have you walked past that was spiritually naked? And instead of talking to them, you talked about them. How many people have you walked by knowing that they are spiritually thirsty and spiritually hungry and instead of talking to them, you talked about them as you were coming here to fare sumptuously on God's word yourself. How many people have you walked past saying, well, they don't know God, God don't know them, so therefore I don't know them, and didn't do what you needed to do to have fellowship with them? by making sure that they're strangers no more. Don't you know that everybody that has breath in their body and blood in their veins is a brother or sister that's a prospect? Yes, we are all a part of the human race, but we want to make them all a part of the spiritual family. We can do no greater good than to help somebody do what they need to do to be born again. You want to secure your soul? Share the gospel. Share Jesus. Share the Christ. Share the one who can make a way out of no way for anybody you talk to. Share the one that can turn anybody's midnight into day. Share the one who can make anybody's wrong right. Jesus stands ready to help. But have we done our part in yielding ourselves as servants of righteousness to be used by God to that end? If not, this is our moment to repent and stop trying to dictate to the potter what we as clay intend on doing. Let's be clay and allow the potter to mold us and make us into what he will have us to be. Let's cease being vessels of dishonor and start being vessels of honor. If this invitation is for you, I stopped by this morning just to let you know that all things are ready. Come to Jesus while you still have time. Wherever you are on this morning, make a wise-hearted decision while together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.